Okay, let's get going. Have a ton of stuff to get through today, as usual. Um, okay, so quick administrative update. Um, uh, there's a few people on the wait list, uh, but most everyone else we've been able to get off uh, the wait list. Um, so if you're in uh, economics or uh, political science, uh, you should be in. Uh, and then there's a couple other uh, people who uh, are still on the wait list. At the moment, we technically are full, but I anticipate tonight, uh, once I post the first homework, that we'll have a couple <laughs> more spaces. Maybe a couple dozen more spaces. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so let's get uh, through stuff uh, for today. Also, uh, CampusWire, if you're going to stay in the class, you definitely need to be have an account on CampusWire so you can participate in the discussions. We've had some good threads uh, the past couple days on, on that, but everybody needs to be participating um, in those. Remember, we're sort of defining good class participation as like one substantive question or answer per week, per person. And uh, some of you, uh, it's already been uh, two weeks and haven't even made an account yet. So you're in the hole uh, there. But uh, I think it's a good thing overall. If you find it distracting and you want to turn off all the notifications, uh, that's fine. But you're still responsible for checking in uh, every now and then, seeing what people have posted, and maybe add your own thoughts uh, and questions. Uh, so there should be more questions than what we've had some good questions, but there should be more. It's not as if everybody is understanding this like perfectly, and that's normal. Uh, but the, the amount of questions we've had is not consistent with the amount of questions that there should be if people are you know, going over their notes, going over the slides, typing in the stuff themselves and then you know challenging yourself so that the questions uh, occur to you that you need to get uh, clarified so that we can have a good foundation uh, moving on when you know doing this Bayesian analysis stuff so this is kind of like the pace that we're going to need to keep up uh, through the whole semester but that entails you know filling in and clarifying some things um, during the the non-class time on campus wire. Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking more about discrete uh, random variables as soon as we talk about the non-random variable that is Columbia University. Uh, it's received uh, lots of grants to develop STAN. I use STAN for research, but I also use it for some business things, so that creates the appearance of a conflict of interest that also led to the appearance of STAN on billions. Uh, so anyway, okay, so one of the things that uh, became clearer on Campus Wire is that not everyone was familiar with Blackjack, uh, even though it is a fairly simple game. Uh, so I put a link uh, to the Wikipedia page um, about that there if you need more, but this is basically just the long and short of it. Uh, so you have to make an initial bet, whatever the minimum of the, the table is, let's say it's like $10, and then each player at the table is dealt two cards face up. And an ace can be either worth one or 11, a king, a queen, a jack are all worth 10, and every other card is worth the number, of, uh, the number on its face up side. And so the value of your hand is the sum of uh, all of the cards. The dealer is gonna have one uh, face up card and one face down card. And you can win, uh, which is to say beat the dealer in one of three ways. Uh, the first is you could be dealt an ace and a card worth a 10. That's known as getting a blackjack, in which case you win as long as the dealer doesn't also have a blackjack, in which case you would tie. You can have a sum that is closer to 21 without going over than the dealer. So you can ask for more cards 
uh, in order to get closer to 21. The dealer is going to stop when the dealer gets to 17, 18, 19, 20, or 21. Uh, so another way to win is to get closer to 21 than the dealer without going over. If you go over, that's known as busting. And you can also win if you don't bust and the dealer does bust and goes over 21. Uh, some more minor uh, things. If a player is dealt two cards of the same value, you have the option to split the cards, uh, double the bet, and essentially play two hands against the dealer simultaneously. And finally, uh, in some circumstances, uh, the player, uh, it's optimal to double down, which is to say after you're seeing your cards, double your bet, in which case you get dealt only one more card, and then you have to stop. Okay, straightforward enough so far? All right, we're gonna play. <laughs> my joker. No jokers. Okay. I will be dealer. Uh, you all get to play. So that's my card. You get to play too. Uh, okay. So two cards for everybody. Okay. So the dealer has one card that is face down. You can't see it. And so that's what makes this like more of a probability uh, problem is because essentially this face down card is a random variable. All the face up cards you can condition on. So uh, it starts with the uh, play to the left. This is known as first base. And so for everyone out there, what two cards do you have? OK, I have a four and a two. So that's six. All right, in this situation, it's impossible to bust with one card. So it's strictly uh, rational to take at least one more card. Okay. In which case, you go like this. <laughs> <laughs> so can okay. you hit more than once? Yes, you can hit more than once yes, you if you want. Okay. okay, so that card was a? Okay, a seven. I had seven. So that brings the total to? <laughs> All right. The dealer has a five, in which case it's a slightly non-trivial uh, question to ask whether it is optimal to hit, take another card again, or stop, stand, all right? In this situation, you're not in a very good spot because you could bust easily with one more card. And so in a situation like this, the optimal strategy in terms of expectations is to stand not take any more cards, and then hope the <laughs> dealer busts, in which case you would win. But you're not in a very good spot right now, conditional on the cards that you can see. Okay, good. Okay, so stop. All right, what we got here? A 10 and a queen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is that worth? 20. 20, okay. Optimal strategy in this situation would be? Stay. Stay, Stay. right. If you take another card, unless it's an ace, you're going to bust, in which case you would lose. But right now, you're in a strong position. All right. You do have the option to split, because two cards have the same value. Uh, but for those of you who saw Hangover 3, uh, the grandmother got attacked by Melissa McCarthy for splitting 10. <laughs> Not a good idea. Because <laughs> you're already likely to win. Um, so taking more cards is bad. What we got here? One three, one ace. Okay, so this can either be four or 14. Oh, question. Um, there are some people who are trying to listen to the live stream and they said that they can't. Uh, yes, the live stream is not actually live. The computer is recording it and I upload it after class. I've not been able to get the live aspect of live stream um, <laughs> working. So um, it'll be available afterward. Any other questions? Okay, back to our regular scheduled game of blackjack. We've got a four or a 14 here. So you can always take one more card and not bust. Even if it's a 10, you can recategorize your ace as one. All right, so we're gonna hit. Okay, that was a... Okay, so we now have nine or 19. No, 10. Uh, 10. 10 
Uh, yes, so we have 10 or 20. Right. In which case, the optimal strategy in terms of expectations would be to stay, stay with the 20. OK, good. You're good at this. What do we have here? Um, Jack and the two. Mm. <laughs> Tough spot to be in because uh, 12 is not going to win unless the dealer goes bust. Uh, but if you get a 10, you bust, in which case you won't win. All right. Uh, so there's the probability calculation as to go what is the expected value of continuing to hit at least once. Um, and it's going to come out positive in this situation. So hitting is better than standing, but you're probably going to lose either way. So you, what do you want to do? Uh, I'll, I'll take 10. All right. God bless you. <laughs> okay. So uh, now we nine. have. Nine. But all together we have. Good. In which case, you will win unless the dealer also ends up with 21. All right? So at this point, you've stayed. And the dealer has a 9. So that's 14. Dealer has to hit jack. It's 24. Dealer bus. Everyone wins. All right? So that's the essence of the card game. We didn't see a situation in which it made it sense to split or to double down, but those exist. Okay. Right. So the purpose of a device like this is to think through what would be the best decision to make when all you have really is probabilities. With those probabilities, you can take expectations. You can choose the strategy in a particular situation that has a higher expectation than some other strategy, even though those may both be negative or they mo may both be positive. Um, you know, you choose the one that is better. And that is sort of a way of approaching uh, strategic games, but it's also a way of approaching like scientific analysis. Or if you're asked to review like a paper and you're trying to decide whether to recommend the paper should be published or not, you can think about this in terms of, you know, what is the expected value of this decision? What is the expected value of that decision? forming a posterior distribution over all the things that you don't know, which in this case are what cards come next, but in general could be you know, future economic growth or you know, parameters in models, all <coughs> sorts of other things that you don't know, but you might have a probability distribution over, and in particular a conditional probability distribution given data. And so basically when you see more cards, that is the analog of having more data. And it adjusts your conditional probabilities, adjusts your conditional expectations, and possibly adjusts what decision you should make as a result of it. So getting at these probabilities is a really important thing. And in situations like this with card games and stuff like that, it's really, if you understand the rules, possible to really like, directly experience what the, the probabilities and so forth are. Questions? Yes? Can you have, in blackjack, can you have positive expected value without counting cards, or do the rules not permit that? So, uh, it is possible to play, and I'll put a link of it on the next slide, uh, so-called basic strategy, maximizing your expectations that um, basically assumes an infinite deck, <clears throat> in which case like the fact that you know, the jack came up doesn't affect the probability that another jack will come up and whatnot. And in that situation, uh, the entire strategy has an expected loss of uh, about half a percent of your initial bet. So you should not play blackjack in a casino uh, that way. But if you do, your expected loss is relatively small. And you might have fun or you know, whatever doing it. Moreover, a situation like this is basically perfect for the casino, a game that has an expected loss for the player, but the variance is relatively large. So some people win, even if they're not good. And that you know, encourages more people to play. But if you have like hundreds of blackjack tables and you just pay dealers minimum wage to deal blackjack uh, 
24 hours a day and you the casino plays you know a million hands of blackjack in a month or something like that they're going to get their expectation you know very close every month and so it's a very consistent revenue for the casino even though it's a very variable uh, proposition for the individual and the casino has essentially infinite money Casinos have been known to go out of business, but that's because they make stupid real estate deals, not because they lose <laughs> on the casino floor. All right? Okay. Doing good with blackjack. Okay, so some questions. Suppose you have a 10 and a 6 from an infinite deck. What's the probability that you end up with exactly 21 if you keep on hitting? Which is perhaps not a good idea, but how would we think about going out that prob probability? Um, the compositions function in the partitions package can be used to obtain all the ways to get a particular integer. Um, so we have a 10 and a 6 now. We're saying, what are all the ways to get 5 more? We could get a 5 and then stop. We could get a 1 and a 4 and then stop. We could get a 2 and a 3 and then stop. All the different ways to add up to 5. Um, are enumerated in the columns here. And so if we have an uh, infinite deck, which is to say, you know, it's possible to get five aces in a row, theoretically, <clears throat> and, you know, you getting one card doesn't affect the probability of the same card uh, coming up next, then it's just, okay, each card has a four over 52 chance of coming up, <clears throat> and then it's just how many non-zero numbers are in each column, that's the number of things that has to happen, and, 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 and. So this is all being multiplied together. So we just raise it to the exponent of the non-zero, uh, some of the non-zero values in these columns, and we get a number like 0.1034. So if you're facing a 16, you have about a 10% chance of being able to make a 21, which is not good, but that's what the number is. Okay. All right, more blackjack questions. So suppose we're just playing with one deck, finite deck, 52 cards. So we have to ignore impossible sequences like five aces in a row. So there's only four aces in the deck. <clears throat> then what is the probability you end up with 21 if you keep on hitting? So that would be, you know, basically the probability you get a 5 and then stop. Probability you get a 4 and a 1, but that can occur in either order. So it's 4 50 seconds times uh, 4 50 first, because once the first card comes, now the deck only has 51 in it. Multiply by 2, etc. through all the possibilities here, except the last one, which is impossible. Right? Add that all up, it comes out to be a slightly different number that's around 10%, but you get the idea. I already have a 10 and a 6. Why is the denominator 52 rather than 50? Uh, yeah, it should be. Uh, in this, in the infinite debt situation, it would be 52, but this one is not exactly right. It should be subtracted. But the idea of like each time a card comes, the probability of the next card changes because the deck has changed is going through. Anyway, it's a little bit less than the 10 that you got before, whether you calculate it right or not. Anyway, here's a link to a paper that was published in like 1960 or so that derived the so-called uh, basic strategy and published it, uh, which you can see more of. Um, on Wikipedia in basic strategy. So it basically tells you, you know, which color, um, what you should do in that situation, depending on what the exact rules are and what the dealer's face up card is in order to uh, have the best expectation compared to the other strategy choices you could make. And this was a result of, of that. Um, paper being published that goes through the probability calculations in more detail. Okay, enough blackjack questions. Unless anybody has another. Okay, so uh, 
blackjack, the bowling thing that we did before, all kind of hinge on there being a finite set. And you know, if you take some away, then the probability of something happening next uh, changes. The Bernoulli distribution uh, is more for you know, independent events, uh, but they can take on the value either zero or one. So our sample space omega here only has two discrete elements. And the Bernoulli distribution depends on a possibly unknown probability parameter pi, which is going to be between zero and one uh, inclusive. And the way in which this works uh, a lot of times is we think of one as being success in some sense, and uh, x equals zero being failure. So the Bernoulli distribution implies you have success with probability pi and failure with probability one minus pi. But rather than writing that um, as a, um, you know, two separate cases, when we write the probability mass function, which is a long name uh, abbreviated PMF for uh, what we've been doing all along, these functions that you can put in elements of a sample space and get back the probability that that happens. So we tend to write the probability mass function um, as a one-line function as opposed to like success case, failure case, uh, et cetera. So we can write the probability of x given pi as pi raised to the power of x times the uh, quantity 1 minus pi raised to the power of 1 minus x. And this is going to be valid for any sample space that is uh, 0 or 1. Okay, So if x is 0, then this is pi to the 0, which is 1. And then you have 1 minus pi to the 1 minus 0, which is just 1 minus pi. Mm -hmm. And if x is 1, then you have pi to the 1, which is 1, multiplied by 1 minus pi to the 0, which is 1. So it just simplifies to pi again. All right. So having these exponents in the um, where exponents go is a pretty common thing that you will see in order to pick out one or the other term, depending on which of the exponents is 0 or 1. OK, so question for you all. What is the expectation of a random variable that has a Bernoulli distribution? And how did you come up with that? One multiplied by pi. One multiplied by pi. Right, so 0 multiplied by anything is 0. So we just have 1 multiplied by pi, which is pi. So the expectation of a Bernoulli random variable is pi. Again, the expectation is a real number. In general, it's not in the sample space of x when uh, the sample space is discrete. OK, good. Uh, what is the variance of a Bernoulli random variable? So how do we define variance? Expectation of x squared minus u squared. Uh, expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. Good. And we just got through saying that the expectation pi. of, so this is pi squared. OK. So uh, what would be the expectation of x squared in the Bernoulli case? Right, so we can uh, take into account that uh, if the sample space is 0 or 1, 0 or 1 squared is going to be the same number. So 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1. So this is going to be pi minus pi squared, or more conventionally written, pi times 1 minus pi. That is the variance of x in the Bernoulli random variable case. Everybody see how we did that? I'm going to erase it, so. The uh, x squared, how do we get that it was a pi? What are we plugging where? Right, so in the simple case, the only case, when the sample space is either 0 or 1, x squared is equal to x for all possible values, namely the two possible values in the sample space. 
So zero squared is still zero and one squared is still one. So this is a trick that only applies when the sample space is zero, one. All right, rolling on. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with logit models, and if not, we'll get to them more uh, in later weeks, you can write pi as a function of some predictor. Let's say you have a predictor z. Uh, well, you could use a, a transformation like this in order to parameterize pi as a function of z and alpha and beta, which you then you know, go on uh, to estimate. So we'll learn about logit regression models in a few weeks. But those involve the Bernoulli distribution for the outcome. So you're estimating a logit model when you have an outcome variable that's like success or failure, like do you vote or do you not vote? Do you have a job or do you not have a job? Things like that. OK, next distribution is the binomial distribution. So a binomial random variable is defined as the sum of n independent Bernoulli random variables all with the same pi. So in that situation, what would the sample space of a binomial random variable be? Everything but zeros at n? All the integers. Right. Okay, so it's a sum of Bernoulli random variables. Now you'll see when you do probability that, okay, a lot of times in order to create new probability distributions, you'll start with one probability distribution like Bernoulli and then ask, you know, what is the distribution of a sum of Bernoullis? What's the distribution of a difference of Bernoullis, et cetera, in order to create other probability distributions that may be applicable in more uh, situations. So <clears throat> what would be an expression for the expectation of a binomial random variable? N times pi. Utilizing the fact that the expectation of a sum is equal to the sum of the expectations. In this case, the expectation of the underlying Bernoulli random variables is pi, and we have n of them, so it's pi plus pi plus pi plus pi n times, or n times pi. Good. What is the expression for the variance of a binomial random variable? So the variance, uh, though I just erased it, but the variance of uh, a Bernoulli random variable is pi times 1 minus pi. <clears throat> and what did we say? Uh, well, I guess we didn't actually say so. I'll tell you. Uh, if you multiply a variance by a constant, like n, the variance goes up according to n squared. Right. That's because variance is in. Uh, squared units. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, what would be an expression for the probability mass function of a binomial random variable if n is equal to 3? So we're conditioning on um, we have three uh, opportunities. And as a hint for thinking about what would be a one line expression uh, for the probability mass function of a binomial random variable. Uh, there are eight possible cases that you need to consider simultaneously. Or you can consider them sequentially and then once you're done, then synthesize them into uh, one uh, line function. Okay, so I'll get you started. So first case, or first two cases to consider are all three of the underlying Bernoulli random variables succeed. And since they're independent of each other, that's just pi cubed. So that's one case. Then another case is that all three of them fail, which is 1 minus pi cubed. So that's two of the eight cases. And then there's six more. Um, there's pi squared quantity 1 minus pi, and you, there are two ways to do that. 
um, and then there's pi times quantity 1 minus pi squared, two ways to do that. Um, and then, uh, what else am I forgetting? 2, 1, 0. So we have one succeed and two fail, but there's actually Oh yeah, yeah, three ways, sorry. Three, yeah. Yeah. That's it. So the, the failure could come first and then the other way. So there's three ways that could happen. And then two succeed and one fails. Pi squared times one minus pi to the first. And there's three ways that could happen. So basically we have uh, these things, and then there's uh, for the interior cases a number of ways in which you can get to that sum. And so it, the general form of the probability mass function for a Bernou uh, binomial random variable uh, conditional on n and pi is uh, n choose x times pi raised to the power of x times 1 minus pi raised to the power of n minus x. So n choose x times pi raised to the number of successes times 1 minus pi raised to the number of failures, where again, as we saw last time, this symbol here is read as n choose x, and it's the number of ways you can choose x out of n possibilities if order doesn't matter, and it uh, can be expressed mathematically as n factorial divided by x factorial divided by the quantity n minus x factorial, defined as 0 if x is greater than n, which it shouldn't be if you've done your sample space right. Okay. Questions about binomial and how it relates to Bernoulli. So uh, just to be clear, so the Bernoulli would be used for uh, like uh, something binary, so like flipping of a coin once. Mm -hmm. And the binomial, like if I keep flipping the coin, I would use binomial. Right. Okay. Provided you flip the coin a fixed number n times. So you choose n in advance. Mm -hmm. You'd have a different distribution if you said, I'm going to flip a coin until I get six heads. Like, how long does that take? That would be something different. Mm -hmm. OK. So back to bowling, everyone's favorite. Um, why would binomial with n equal 10 not be uh, appropriate distribution to analyze the first role of a frame of bowling with. Yes? Because they're not independent. Right. The pins is not independent of each other. And so just saying, OK, you know, Bernoulli for is the fourth pin knocked down is not going to be independent from whether the third pin or the fifth pin is knocked down. Okay, so that's not good. Um, could the Bernoulli distribution be used for the probability that a bowler gets a strike on the first roll of their frame of bowling? Yes. Yes, why? Um, yes, because a strike or not strike is basically a, it's a Bernoulli, it's a Bernoulli thing. It's, it's all or nothing, one and zero. Right. Finding a composite event of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is failure, and strike is success, in which case um, you don't have the problems uh, enumerated in the first bullet if you consider the pins individually, if you sort of clump all the non-strikes into the same event. So that would be kind of plausible. Could the Bernoulli be used for the probability of knocking down the front pin, like they're arranged in a triangle? I mean, I, I think yes, because again, that's just, it happens or it doesn't. In particular, um, the first pin is in front. So basically, in order for it to be knocked down, you basically have to hit it with the bowling ball. It doesn't so much depend on the pins behind it. Um, but the back pins very much depend on the pins in front of them. OK. So if we define x sub i as an indicator function, is the ith pin knocked down in bowling? 
and pi i is the probability of the ice pin being knocked down under a Bernoulli distribution, what conceptually do we have by this expression here? <clears throat> probability of the first pin being knocked down given pi 1 multiplied by the product of i equal 2 to 10 of the conditional probability of the ice pin being knocked down given that uh, the previous pins were or were not knocked down. So x1 is equal to little x1, x2 is equal to little x2, etc. What sort of a thing do we have here? What results when we take a marginal probability times a conditional probability? Joint. So, yeah, so if we, if we didn't have this whole uh, product, so pi means multiply all these things. So let's just say we had probability of x1 given pi1 times the probability of x2 given pi2. What would that be? Just two terms? So marginal probability of knocking down the first pin times conditional probability of knocking down the second pin given the first pin. That would be the probability of knocking down the first pin and the second pin. And then if we multiply that by the probability of knocking down the third pin, given that the first pin was or was not knocked down, times the probability that the second pin was or was not knocked down, now what do we have? Three. So we now have a joint probability uh, function for the probability of knocking down the first pin and the second pin and the third pin. And we can take that all the way up to 10 and get a joint distribution uh, for yes or no knocking down each of the 10 pins. But it's kind of a more complicated thing because we have 10 different pies to be estimating. But we could do something like that, maybe. OK. So the next probability distribution we want to consider is the Poisson distribution for counts. Uh, so you might say to yourself, and this happens a lot uh, when thinking about probability distributions, you have one probability distribution, and then you ask, what would happen to that probability distribution in the limit as something goes to infinity? So in this case, we're going to consider what happens to the binomial distribution in the limit as n, the number of uh, tries, goes to infinity. But that by itself is not very interesting because if pi is positive and you have an infinite number of tries, you're going to have an infinite number of successes. So what we're instead going to consider is a limiting process where the number of trials goes up, 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 but the success probability goes down, down, down in such a way that n times pi, the expectation remains fixed. So n is increasing toward infinity at the same rate that pi is decreasing toward 0, so that the product of n and pi remains a fixed constant, mu. And now we're going to ask what happens to the binomial probability mass function uh, under that limiting process. <clears throat> and it involves uh, a few steps. So for pi, we can substitute mu over n. And then we have this piece, uh, 1 minus pi raised to the power n minus x. So this is going towards 0, but the exponent is going toward infinity. There's some uh, Le Hapital's rule uh, involved in that. But it basically comes out to e to the negative mu using one of the many equivalent ways of defining the exponential function. If you were a math major, you'd know that, but you're not, so I'm just going to tell you. Second piece, uh, what happens to the n choose x times pi to the x? So this can be written you know, with the factorials and whatnot. If we just kind of switch things around, like move the n to the x over here and move the x factorial um, over there, we get a product of n terms in the numerator, uh, or product of x terms in the numerator, all involving n. And we have n to the x in the denominator. So that's going to approach 1. 
<coughs> and that leaves us mu to the x divided by x factorial. Those are not related to n, uh, so there's no limiting there. It's just this piece here approaches 1. So you put those two together, <coughs> and you get what is known as the probability mass function of the so-called Poisson distribution, which is uh, the x, or x given mu. It, the probability for any value of x can be found by evaluating mu raised to the power of x times e to the negative mu divided by x factorial. And that is going to be a valid probability mass function if the sample space is all non-negative integers. So this is a very prevalent distribution used when modeling counts. So the number of vetoes that a president uh, makes, or you know, the number of times that a country uh, goes to war, or something like that, <clears throat> that doesn't have any theoretical upper bound, uh, can, maybe it's not great, but it can be modeled using a Poisson distribution. All right. Questions about Poisson? Yes. Yeah, based on what I read, uh, it seems like Poisson distribution uh, is used or should be used when the distribution is sort of not normal, but it's slanted. Uh, and or like when the, if I remember correctly, like the mu is uh, pretty much equivalent to the variance. Is that right? Mm -hmm. As it relates to the normal distribution, the normal distribution is over a continuous sample space, all real numbers. This is over all non-negative integers. So even though the shape of a Poisson, if you take it out long enough, can look kind of normal, it's actually theoretically kind of different from a normal. And we'll be talking about continuous distributions like the normal next week. As to the part about what is the variance of a Poisson random variable, as Andre uh, said, <coughs> the Poisson has the property that the variance of x is equal to mu. And that is due uh, to the following, which is something I screwed up when I said it before. So the variance of a Bernoulli random variable, x, is actually equal to n times pi times 1 minus pi. So I said it wrong uh, earlier, and it's going on YouTube. But anyway, I'll correct myself now. Uh, the sum of n independent random variables, we talked about that last time, so I should remember. What was the formula for the sum of, let's say, two uh, the variance of a sum from last time? Yes? Right. So the variance of the first thing plus the variance of the second thing plus twice their covariance. But if the underlying Bernoulli random variables are independent, their covariance is 0. So if I just had two of them, the variance would be 2 times the variance of 1. And if I had n, it would be n times the variance of 1. And so from here, we have the variance of a Bernoulli random variable, pi times 1 minus pi. So the variance of a binomial random variable, which is the sum of independent uh, Bernoulli random variables with the same pi, is n times pi times 1 minus pi. So if we substitute uh, here for pi um, mu over n and put over here 1 minus mu over n, we get <coughs> cancellation here. 1 minus mu over n is just going to go to 1 as n goes to infinity. So what we're left with is mu. So the Poisson distribution has the property that the variance and the expectation are the same number. Now, the expectation and the variance are very different concepts. One pertains to location, one pertains to spread. But the Poisson has sort of a miraculous property, which is more of a curse than a blessing, that the variance and the expectation are the same number, even though they're different things. All right. See what I did here? And see the correct formula for the variance of a binomial? <laughs>
Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, you were saying just now that you use the Poisson distribution to model all these things. Why would you not use the binomial distribution instead? We prefer to use the Poisson or maybe something else uh, when the number of trials is not theoretically fixed in advance. Like I was saying with Andre, if you flip coins and you say, I'm going to flip a coin six times, you should use binomial uh, for the number of heads or whatever, because you know in advance you're going to stop after six trials. If there's no theoretical limit as to the number of opportunities that you might have, then that's when you want to use the Poisson or a better distribution for counts because you don't have that fixed upper bound to run into. Does that relate in any way to the Edmund and Fennigan type zero thing? Yes. So basically, the Poisson is the limit of a binomial as n goes to infinity, provided the success probability at any instant is going to zero, um, such that the expectation remains fixed. So, but basically, to simplify, when you don't have an obvious upper bound, that's when you might think about using Poisson, negative binomial, some other distributions that are defined for this sample space, the non-negative integers. Could be interesting. OK. Rolling along, let's take a moment to define what moments are. <clears throat> so the expectation of a random variable raised to the kth power is called the kth moment of x. Usually, but not always, we're talking about the situation where k is a non-negative integer. <clears throat> so that's the so-called raw kth moment. The expectation of x minus mu quantity raised to the power of k is known as the kth central moment of the random variable x. And this actually applies whether x is discrete or continuous uh, sample space. <clears throat> but let's think specifically about the case where x is distributed Poisson with expectation 1. So what would the value of the expectation of a Poisson random variable with the expectation of 1 raised to the power of 0? One. Right. So anything uh, finite raised to the power of 0 is going to be 1. So this is literally asking, like, what's the expectation of 1, which is just 1. OK, that was easy. Uh, what is uh, the kth moment? So the expectation of x raised to the power of 1. 1. In this case, yes. x raised to the power of 1 is just x. So we're asking, what's the expectation of x? And we said this comes from a Poisson with expectation of 1. So in this case, expectation of x raised to the power of 1 would be 1. In general, it's just mu. But mu in this case is 1. OK. What is the expectation <coughs> of x squared if x is Poisson with the expectation of 1? Which would be? 1. OK. 2. Can I get a 3? <laughs> 2 and a half. These don't have to be integers. How would you, for those of you who think you know the answer, how did you arrive at that? Uh, because the variance of the Poisson is 1. And it's the uh, expectation of the x squared minus the squared of expectation. Yeah. And you, if you add that uh, variance and plus the uh, squared expectation, you got two. You're going to have to practice that. OK, so yes, that was the correct answer. Let's just say that a little bit louder. Um, so again, we have the variance of x is equal uh, to the square of the expectation, or the uh, expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. right? And this was just 1 squared. So this is just 1. 
Okay, and we know that the variance of x under a Poisson is equal to mu, which is just 1. So we have 1 is equal to the expectation of x squared minus 1. We add 1 to both sides, and we get 2 is equal to the expectation of x squared if x has a Poisson distribution with the expectation of 1. See how we did that? So these expectations of a Poisson uh, uh, case moments uh, that have an expectation of 1 are known as the Bell numbers. They come up in number theory. Um, they don't come up much in, in probability except in this one context. So the 0th Bell number is 1. And you can write the other Bell numbers recursively. <coughs> so the k plus 1 Bell number is equal to the sum of uh, over from j equals 0 to k of uh, k choose j multiplied by the jth uh, bell number. So this is more complicated, but it's kind of like the sequence of Fibonacci numbers in the sense that you can write like the next bell number as a weighted sum of all the previous bell numbers. Fibonacci is easier because you just have to add the previous two Fibonacci numbers. But it's the same sort of idea. And indeed, a similar idea comes up with basically all famous uh, integer sequences, of which the bell is definitely one of them, even though you probably never heard of it, unless you were a math major. OK. Why might we use the bell numbers? Bowling. <clears throat> Specifically, parameterized Bowling. Now, I should say in advance, and I alluded to this on Campus Wire, uh, that this is going to be a little bit of a contrived example. So the uh, bowling is really good because it's uh, simple and it's easy to think about how the conditioning works. You know, if you only have six pins available, you know, you have to take that into consideration. Uh, what I'm going to do here is to introduce an additional parameter which is going to give us more flexibility for modeling bowling if we were to choose to do so, which we are not. But if we were, uh, it would give us more flexibility. But the reason why this is a little bit contrived is usually when we talk about parameters, we think of them as being continuous. And then you know maybe we try to estimate them or whatever. In this case, we've only talked about discrete distributions so far. And so I'm limited in what I can do to have this like really make sense to just discrete distributions. But I can come up with one that is technically valid and you know maybe plausible. So here we have a probability distribution for the number of pins knocked down that depends on the number of pins n available to be knocked down and an unknown parameter, which is which Greek letter? Good. How many of you knew that? Two. What did I say about learning the Greek letters? Greek. Do it. All right. So this is going to depend on the unknown parameter upsilon, which is defined as a positive integer. And I can write this conditional probability of knocking down x out of n pins given the person's personal upsilon. <coughs> as a function of bell numbers. And this is going to be a valid probability mass function for any upsilon that is a positive integer. So for those of you who have R, you can source in tinyurl2020bowling3. Uh, and this will create uh, this function to evaluate that probability mass function, which is kind of not trivial because the bell numbers can get really big and it's Hard to evaluate them accurately. But anyway, it creates this probability mass function and a couple other things. So if I evaluate this probability mass function with upsilon equal to 1, I get the following probabilities for knocking down x out of n, where n is equal to 10, pins. And these all add up to 1. And they're clearly positive. So this is going to be a valid probability mass function. Maybe not super intuitive, because the upsilon is not that intuitive. And insofar as the upsilon is intuitive, 
it's not intuitive as to why this would be on a sample space of the positive integers. But mathematically, it's still all going to go through. OK. So the question we want to ask ourselves next, which is really the question we want to ask for the course, is how can we obtain a probability distribution for upsilon given the person's bowling data that we might collect? And again, I think maybe on Canvas Wire, people were still taking the bowling thing a little bit too literally. It's still just a metaphor for, you know, you can think about it as probability distribution for the number of successes on a finite number of tasks. Or more generally speaking, how can we get the conditional distribution of something we don't know given what we do know, which is a general like scientific uh, thing that we might be interested in. But like the bowling and the huge uh, odd integer and blackjack, these things we're not interested in them for themselves. We're interested in them as devices for thinking through the implications of probability theory. So if we want the posterior distribution of an unknown upsilon given bowling data, what do we need? What are the three things we need to evaluate to compute that? What rule do we need to invoke in order to compute that? Bayes rule. The answer is always Bayes rule. <laughs> it's in the title of the class. You just have to figure out how. All right. So what are the three pieces on the right hand side of Bayes rule if this is the left hand side? So in the numerator you would have the probability of data given upsilon times probability of upsilon divided by probability of data. That is having data and not having data. Or uh, data happening and not happening. Like yeah, we, we want a condition on the data that we might collect by watching someone bowl and try to get the posterior distribution of that person's upsilon. All right, that's the three pieces on the right hand side of Bayes rule. So for starters, how can we think about this upsilon? So what I've uh, plotted here on the uh, horizontal axis are different values of upsilon. Again, these have to be uh, integers, so this is not actually continuous, but it looks that way. I've also put it on the log scale here because it made it easier to see the plot with big numbers. And on the vertical axis here, I have the conditional expectation for the number of pins knocked down on the first roll of a frame of bowling as a function of the person's upsilon, which we don't know, but we're going to try to get a posterior distribution on based on the data that we have for observing someone bowl. Okay. And we can see here that we have a monotonically decreasing relationship between the expectation of the number of pins knocked down on the first roll of a frame of bowling and the person's upsilon. And in particular for not super small but moderately big uh, values of upsilon, there's approximately a linear relationship between the conditional expectation of the number of pins knocked down on the first roll and the logarithm of upsilon over a big range of possible values of upsilon that are uh, positive integers. Right? So uh, we can represent, and this was one of the things that was talked about on Campus Wire for those of you who were reading it, which all of you should, that the first bowling distribution we started off with with the ratio of Fibonacci numbers seemed a little bit um, arbitrary because it, would, it might apply to some bowler who has like a 38% chance of getting a strike and like a lesser chance of all the other things. But it has no flexibility to model like really good bowlers or really bad bowlers. It's just like there could exist a person to which this assumed distribution would apply. When we introduce parameters, we now have a family of distributions that are indexed by the different values of upsilon uh, among the positive integers. And so now our distribution that we're going to use for bowling potentially applies to very good bowlers whose expectation on the first roll is a little bit greater than eight. Or, you know, 
intermediate to, to kind of bad. And if I made the plot go out farther, really bad <laughs> bowlers who have like expected number of pins of like one uh, to knock down on the first all frame of bowling. So we can use this to capture uh, almost all bowlers. It's not going to work for men's professional bowling well because they would have a conditional expectation on their first roll of a frame of bowling that's higher than like eight and a quarter. But for everyone else, there is some upsilon that gives me the, the expectation for that person. So if we want to think about a prior distribution for upsilon, we can start by saying, OK, what do we think this person's conditional expectation is for the number of pins they would knock down on the first roll of a frame of bowling? So think to yourselves, if you were modeling yourself, what do you think you could achieve you know, on average for your first roll of a frame of bowling? So think of what that number is. And then go over to the curve and down to the horizontal axis. That would be a plausible value of upsilon for you. Anybody want to share what they think their conditional <laughs> expectation on the first roll of the frame of bowling is? I think closer to 4,000 to me on the long scale. So you think that you would have an expect, expected number of pins around uh, you know, four and a quarter or so. OK. <laughs> Honest. I like it. Anybody else? Anybody gone bowling in the past decade? OK, what'd you get? Like maybe six and seven. Ooh. But then like maybe nothing on the second time. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so let's give you a six and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Over to the curve, down, you might have an upsilon of about 50. But we see how we do that. And we see that this could work for anyone except people who are like professionals. So now we need to take that insight, such it is, as it is, and uh, translate it into a whole probability distribution to use as our prior for upsilon. So we need a prior that's defined on the sample space of all positive integers. There's a few to choose from. One, which is kind of simple, is known as the logarithmic distribution. It depends on an unknown parameter p, which is between 0 and 1, but isn't really interpretable as a probability. But in any event, <coughs> the conditional probability of uh, upsilon taking on any positive integer value, given p, can be expressed as p to the upsilon divided by <coughs> the quantity negative upsilon times the logarithm of 1 minus p. So this is, it's not super obvious uh, what's going on with this probability mass function. But you can look it up on Wikipedia or do the math yourself and find that the expectation of upsilon uh, given p is equal to p divided by p minus 1 times log 1 minus p. So you can choose a p to achieve a desired prior expectation on upsilon. So if I were to choose, you know, just plug in some values, play around with it, uh, p is like 0.946. That gives me an implied expectation for upsilon of around uh, 6, which would be, you know, someone whose uh, uh, expectation for the first roll is around 8. So like very good, uh, but perhaps not professional good. So if I just put 0.946, I can evaluate this. Now, technically, upsilon can be any positive integer, like up to infinity. But we can only do a finite number of calculations on a computer. Um, so you know, we're just going to use some big sequence of positive integers starting with 1. And so how might we be able to tell if our sequence of integers is big enough so it's like close enough to infinity that we can stop adding additional terms? Well, one way we can do that is we can evaluate the probability mass function over some fixed finite number of terms and see if the probability 
uh, adds up to one, you know, as far as a computer can represent, which is like 16 decimal places. So here it sums up to one, we're good. So basically a thousand is close enough to infinity if P is equal to 0.946 for us to move forward. And if we calculate the expectation, it's indeed close to six, not exactly, but close enough. So if we had a bowler and we thought their expectation for the number of pins knocked down on the first roll was about eight because like they had a bowling costume on or you know, whatever, <clears throat> then we can get the, you know, upsilon that would correspond to that, which is around uh, six, let's say, and we could get the P, which achieves uh, expected upsilon of six uh, by just, you know, plugging in some numbers and 0.946 basically achieves this, okay? So if P is 0.946, that's fixed given, we could evaluate the probability, prior probability of upsilon for any positive integer and we don't really need to go past a thousand <laughs> if we're talking about somebody that we think is pretty good. Now that would be different for you know Andre here. <clears throat> We'd have to go out farther, <laughs> but not for Karina. Got it? Okay. So what then is? Oh, question. Sorry if I missed this, but what is P representing again? And I'm, I'm like kind of like messing with it in R, and it looks like it's like pretty like top heavy almost. I don't know if it's like the right term, but it's like difference in upsilon, so like P between 0.95 and like 99. That is true uh, because of the logarithm business here and also uh, taking it to the power of upsilon. Uh, what's not great about the logarithmic distribution in this context is I really don't have an interpretation for P. It's between zero and one, but it's not a probability. So really, I'm only indirectly choosing a reasonable value of P based on what I think is a reasonable value of upsilon, based on what I think is a reasonable conditional expectation for the number of pins knocked down on the first roll. So this goes back to what I'm saying. I can do this mathematically, but the fact that I'm limiting myself to discrete distributions makes this a bit awkward. But it makes it a bit awkward if you cared about bowling. If you cared about math, it's like, okay, what the hell? You know, P. Okay. So that's one piece of the numerator of Bayes' rule. What's the other piece of the numerator of Bayes' rule? There's only two pieces. Which one did we just get through talking about? Upsilon. Right, so the prior on Upsilon. Then we want to multiply it by something that conditions on Upsilon. What's that something? Data, number of pins being knocked down. If we, ha if we watch someone bowl, okay. <clears throat> so let's say we had a realization on the first roll of the first frame of bowling. How would we express the probability that upsilon is equal to something and the first roll was equal to x1 pins <coughs> given p and given that we start with n equal to uh, it, n equal 10 pins how would we compute that roughly not looking for exact numbers it's the process the steps the rule We've only learned three rules. All right, in the interest of time, I will move on. Uh, but is something you ought to be able to get. So if we make a matrix, in this case it's not going to be square, it's going to be rectangular uh, for the joint probability of upsilon and the first roll of a frame of bowling, we can loop over the possible values of upsilon and fill in a row of our joint probability table of taking the logarithmic prior on uh, upsilon multiplied by the conditional probability of knocking down 0, 1, 2, up to 10 pins when 10 are available 
if upsilon is equal to one, if upsilon is equal to two, if upsilon is equal to three, all the way up to whatever is the biggest value of upsilon we want to consider. So now joint PR is going to be this rectangular thing that has like a thousand rows, even though I could only show 18 here, and 10 columns, one for each of the, or 11 columns, one for each of the possibilities of what could happen for the number of pins on the first roll of a frame of bowling. So the probability that upsilon is equal to two and the nine pins were knocked down on the first roll of frame of bowling is equal to this, which I obtained for uh, when y is two plugging in here, and I got this for nine pins. So four and a half percent chance that upsilon is two and the result of the first roll of the first frame of bowling is nine pins knocked down. And the same for all the other combinations of upsilon and x1. And as you can see, you know, already as you get to you know, upsilon 18, the probability of upsilon being 18 and anything happening uh, on the first roll of the frame of bowling gets to be pretty small numbers. And even more, and they get smaller as you get to bigger values of upsilon. So you can imagine as we go out to upsilon is a thousand, that's like a really small numbers in that row. The probability that upsilon is equal to a thousand and you knock down, you know, nine pins or whatever on the first roll of a frame of bowling, very, very small number converging to zero number as upsilon gets real big. Okay. So that, by multiplying those things together, gives us uh, values for the numerator of Bayes' rule. And then we want to consider what's the denominator of Bayes' rule. So what would that be, and how would we compute it? So what are we looking for in the denominator? Data, probability, probability of data, not given upsilon, but given p and n. So like given the rules of bowling, but not with reference to any particular upsilon. And so the probability of data given p and n, but irrespective of upsilon, we calculate by hmm? marginal probabilities. Good. Marginal probability of the data. How do we get the marginal probability for what happens on the first roll of a frame of bowling, irrespective of upsilon? Sum down the columns. Or sum over the rows, rows representing upsilon. So <clears throat> what's the sum of joint PR? The rectangle we made on the previous slide? One. Yes. And then how will we obtain the marginal probability? Summing down the columns. So if we sum it up, it's actually 0 0.99999. That's because we didn't go all the way out to infinity. It's also because it's not possible to accu accurately evaluate it perfectly, but definitely close enough for this to be um, valid. <clears throat> and we can take the column sums of that in order of, to obtain the probability of knocking down all these numbers of pins on the first roll of a frame of bowling irrespective of upsilon, and we can stick any of those numbers that we want into the denominator of Bayes' rule, depending on the data we observe on the first roll of a frame of bowling. All right, so we got our numerator, we got our denominator. What do we do with a numerator and a denominator in order to make Bayes' rule work? Divide. Divide. The numerator by the denominator. So suppose x1 is 7. What's the posterior probability for all values of upsilon? Given the p that we start with, 10 pins start uh, upright, and we knock down 7 on the first roll of our frame of bowling. Uh, we can plot that by just taking the column of our rectangle with index 7, divide by the sum <laughs> in that column, and then put it in a plot like this. We see that there's like 28% chance that upsilon is 1, 14% uh, chance that upsilon is 2, 9% chance that upsilon is 3, etc. 
and the probability that upsilon is anything uh, gets real small as we get into moderate to big integer values of upsilon. So this is a graphical bar plot depiction of our posterior distribution of upsilon given one data point. Now, the nice thing about Bayes' rule is it's actually correct for each data point individually, as opposed to a lot of frequentist things that, insofar as they're correct, are only correct as the number of observations goes to infinity, or a lot of things in supervised learning that are like only useful for big data. Bayes' rule is correct and coherent one data point at a time. Now, if you want to estimate something precisely, you might want to watch a whole game of bowling or many games of bowling instead of just taking one data point. But this is valid. Yes? So uh, in this example, the upsilon is a term indicative of the proficiency of the bowler. Right? It's Even really lack of proficiency because it's an inverse relationship. <laughs> but yeah. OK. Yeah. That's why I chose upsilon, because it reminded me of oops. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so what's the posterior distribution conditional on one whole frame? So we have x1 equals 7, x2 equals 2, let's say. Same process. We have a prior. Then we evaluate the likelihood of that frame given upsilon. So that's the probability of knocking out 7 pins on the first roll for each value of upsilon times the conditional probability of knocking down 2 pins given that three were available for each value of upsilon. That gives us a vector of 1,000 likelihood values. Multiply prior by likelihood in the numerator. <clears throat> Sum the numerator to get the denominator. Plot the ratio. And now, <clears throat> the posterior probability that upsilon is 1 has gone up to like 0.32, where it was like 0.29 if we only conditioned on the first roll. Now we're conditioning on both rolls in the first frame. And you know, probability that it's 2 has gone up to 0.15, et cetera. Last thing, I could get the same posterior distribution in a different way. So I said my first posterior probability mass function was just joint PR of 7 divided by all the numbers in the 7 column of joint PR. So what if I use that posterior distribution for what happens on the first roll as my prior on upsilon for what happens on the second roll of that same frame. So now I want to know what's the prob uh, posterior probability of upsilon given that there's three pins left and two pins were observed to be knocked down using my posterior distribution after the first roll as my prior distribution for the second roll of that frame and conditioning that there's uh, three pins up. So my prior is actually my posterior distribution after one roll. Likelihood is now just the conditional on the second roll of that frame, whatever that is. Numerator is prior times likelihood. Denominator is the sum of the numerator. Plot, identical to the plot on the previous one. So I can obtain the posterior distribution in one step by using all the data simultaneously and multiplying the marginal times the conditional and all that. Or I can obtain it in as many steps as I have data points by doing it one step at a time, calculating the posterior distribution given all my data previously and using that as my prior distribution for uh, then you know, multiply by the likelihood of the next data point. And this like coherence that it doesn't matter if all the data come at once or like one at a time, you get the same posterior distribution at the end, is sort of a very necessary uh, condition for having a coherent, rational updating process for beliefs about unknown given data. It would be weird if it mattered like how the data got chunked up, but it doesn't, at least in theory subject to like rounding errors and stuff on your computer. But in principle, you get the same thing either way. OK, that's all we have time for today. I will post the homework uh, tonight. Um, for those of you who are still kind of on the fence about taking the class, definitely check out the homework and see if this is something that you think you're going to be uh, able to succeed on to some extent.
But bear in mind that there's people on the waiting list. And so if you like stay in and like next week decide to drop, we can't add anybody else. So for that reason, as long as there's left people on the waiting list, I'm not going to allow anybody to switch to our credit at the end of the semester because you're, you're basically blocking somebody who wants to take it for a grade uh, from being able to get in the class in the first place. So think about that. Don't, you know, I'm just going to continue on this for a couple more weeks and then drop because that's not really fair to the people on the wait list. Okay, if you have questions, post on Canvas Wire.